Welcome. This is the December 7th Beehive Call. We have Andrew, Jan, Chris, Levi, and myself, Michael. Hopefully others will join. Uh, small news <laughs> items. The jail and open ZFS calls are up from yesterday. And Doug R., who's been involved with one of the OCI frameworks on FreeBSD, could not make the jail call slot. So we're doing an introductory, perhaps one-off call 24 hours from now. Same bet time, same bat channel. Okay, different Zoom link. Uh, there is information on the calendar link that has all of that if you need. That should be at the top of this document. So if you're interested in OCI, that is up there. Uh, let's see, for, prior to recording, it sounds like Andrew has the in-kernel, not smart OS, but OmniOS SIF server authenticating against an Active Directory server. So if he bumps into those docs, he'll probably share those. We talked a little about uh, ZFS history, and I will just throw out a rhetorical question there, like could that history be more fine-grained? It is a ring buffer. You do get the critical things like the pool creation, but what if you could say, hey, I really need for auditing all the snapshotting information, but you can dump, I don't know, renames and other stuff. So. It's a broader question. And for a Beehive question, uh, I would love to know if anyone's tried the insider previews of Windows Server on Beehive. I didn't get past the loader, which slightly maybe is a dependence on, T dependence on TPM. Possibly it needs a newer CPU, but it failed so early that that doesn't even seem plausible. If you got insights, please share them. And so I suspect Jan will have a um, some information later, but Levi, you brought up this point on the jail call, but it may hit Beehive users harder. You observe that first off, well, we all know the CPU spectrum meltdown mitigations will impact performance, but that impact might blossom when it comes to networking. Uh, do you want to tell us more about this uh, conversation? Yes. You've had? So this is mostly aimed at uh, Proxmox. That's what I run at work, but I had run into a pretty significant issue with uh, VLANs not working on one of my servers. Um, basically, the workaround based on one of those threads was to disable the mitigations. Uh, on top of that, I believe that link also shows that uh, Windows Server was abusing the CPU at a much higher rate than it should have been. So I was noticing anywhere from 20 to 40% overall CPU usage at the host level versus now. And that, that VM only had maybe four cores. So there was no reason it should have been taking that much CPU time. So once I disabled the mitigations and confirmed it using LS CPU, I was able to determine that, okay, the mitigation are now off and everything seems to be back to normal. And this is mostly affecting kernels uh, 6.2 and 6.5 for Linux. Uh, I also know I did install the microcode, which probably did not help the situation. But not knowing and wanting to make sure that we were, you know, everything was patched. That's the route I went down. Um, there's a longer discussion. These servers are not publicly facing in any way. So the, there's a longer discussion if these mitigations do have any sort of vulnerability at the hosting level for those at public services attached. Uh, they also recommended disabling KSM tuning, which is some form of kernel memory sharing. But yeah, that that form goes on for about, I don't know, 12 pages. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pretty, pretty uh, significant deep dive. Um, so... I'm looking now to see what the commands were to disable it in FreeBSD, just so we have that kind of handy. But yeah, it's uh, very interesting to see how badly these mitigations are are affecting performance. And I would love to know, are we nesting mitigations such that the guest OS is also mitigating against what might be a pretty unlikely scenario and you've shared a link for it true now let's take a look at well, that um, so go ahead the Jan. problem is it it is not simply uh, black and white because sometimes uh, updating the microcode enables certain mitigations in microcode always 
but the alternative is in most cases to have an even worse mitigation in software. So sometimes you, yes, you lose a little bit by installing the latest microcode, but you close a hole which otherwise requires a workaround in software and you hope that the workaround is written in such a way that it detects that the microcode is patched and then doesn't apply it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you have things but... like um, these kinds of things here all over the CTL tree. You have the indirect branch prediction stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. You have, uh, yeah, me I think this here is uh, metadata uh, with stores. So uh, because you can snoop at the timing of store queues and stuff like this. Yeah, but the question is, do you need it on this specific microarchitecture? Or what are the impacts? That's a uh, really um, nuanced discussion. And you're always dancing on the edge of a knife. Yep. And, they, you know, the issue for us at my work was that, oh, yeah, I don't have my VLANs don't work like networking just straight up quit. Hmm. So I can't have that in production. So, of course not. But yeah. that is not but, how the mitigation should manifest. That's probably a real normal kind of bug. And at least. Right. Yeah. The mitigations may manifest at things like, oh, yeah. In this case, the context switch is 40% more expensive, and this workload is dominated by context switches. So I lost 35% or so of throughput. Right. And that, uh, I, that I would have been completely switches. fine with. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's very interesting to see how these things manifest and how they're affecting other so, critical portions um, of the kernel. FreeBSD, at least 14, has a main page for all the mitigations. Mm -hmm. uh, listing them off um, and describing what they do, you still have to know what it is and why you would want to do it. But there's a whole section on hardware vulnerability uh, mitigation. Well, interesting. Because it was the last one to be added, probably before the manual page made it into 14, then Bleed has a more detailed one. And oh, yes. Hmm. Then bleed, it's called out right there. Yeah, and uh, it's really a horrible uh, bug. So let me ask you this, Jan. For these mitigations and for these vulnerabilities, I see hit and miss information that they're not very easy to exploit. And they're also not a very good way of exploiting that level of CPU as they're normally very slow. Is it have you seen that these are a, a major issue in publicly facing stuff where there's a actually a high risk? I've played around with in 2017 or 18 when it was all the newest rage and found out that yes, on at least at the time modern Intel CPUs, you could dump the uh, disk encryption keys from an unprivileged process on an Intel CPU. Oh, wow. Okay. Because you can really just sample the kernel memory, look for anything which looks like an AES key, and use a timing side channel to slowly leak that. And once you have detected the location, a few kilobit per seconds are fast enough. And yeah, you can do such things. And if you have any idea of where they should be, you can do worse. But yeah, the problem is that, for example, Zenbleed. Uh, you have to defend against that because if you use SIMD instruction at all, the normal code isn't going to encounter this behavior, which is why um, your normal code works and it wasn't immediately detected when the CPU came to the market. But if you have another thread running, for example, on the neighboring hyper thread, uh, doing unusual things which aren't privileged, just a bit of a low level dark sorcery you can do for normal user space, then you can basically force the microarchitecture to go through states which aren't really foreseen and produce side channels, or at worst, even in this case of Zenbleed, corrupt the uh, microarchitecture state in such a way that 
it's on the uh, it leaks the register content into the wrong uh mark wrong thread because the hardware thinks that they are zeroed but they aren't basically so you can basically uh have the hardware think that v0 upper has been uh, committed when it hasn't and v0 upper basically is an instruction to switch the hardware configuration between different SIMD uh, extension levels so that you can treat it as if you had a half the size register file like the older CPUs and you don't have to save the upper half. And yeah. A uh, super simple question. If your virtual machines were all to have a single vCPU, would you not be suffering from speculative integration? Uh, execution or at least some subset of the some issues. would be harder to exploit or maybe not exploitable at all but the problem is that you can potentially attack different guests okay interesting uh let me if throw the host this is through. undefended against this you may be able from a virtual machine uh to uh slowly leak the con host kernel memory hmm. oh interesting okay and it's get... really, it breaks the assumptions. So all of these kind of hardware bugs are mostly about accidental timing side channels in the microactive. What it means is you have an instruction set. That is the contract an operating system should be written against. It specifies this instruction does this to the hardware. The problem is that when the actual hardware does in no way or shape uh, look like an i386 or 486 um, where we had a, a close correspondence between uh, those. the hardware implementation is completely different for performance reasons and you don't want to give up that performance most of it the problem is that the program you can basically have the cpu speculate ahead of time uh, and speculate on a, a path which would have been forbidden to actually follow. But instead of crashing your program because it's only speculation, once it comes time, you this mistrained speculating CPU detects, no, no, oh, uh, yeah, I, I assumed you were, wanted to jump down the cliff, but you don't. Not a problem. Let's uh, walk along the cliff. The next thing... Uh, uh, an exploit for these kind of bugs does is and then observe the side effects left behind from the speculation. So something which never really ended up in a, for example, general purpose register, like loading a pointer from the kernel address space, um, that it ends up in the cache. You don't have permissions to access it, but you can use it to basically read a forbidden byte from memory, use it as index into a, an array you're allowed to read, and then you, uh, but afterward, you measure which one of the array elements, which are at least the cache line and size, is already cached by measuring the time it takes to read from it. So you basically use the forbidden knowledge as indexed from any timing side channel you're allowed to analyze later. And hmm. that's such a nasty thing because it is out of the scope of the instruction set specification. The timing detail is not specified. You can say that the vulnerable CPUs are compliant with the instruction set uh, specification because uh, the instruction set that doesn't say uh, that there is no timing side channel. It just says that you cannot read the real value, but that you can observe the time it takes to do something that's expected. Hmm. Problem is that you can basically cross this model and that breaks the assumptions. And you kind of have to mitigate against those unless you really know what they the worst case impact of them is and that it is uh, acceptable to you. Some of them may be perfectly acceptable or 
for example, for an HPC cluster where you know that you are running only one application on a node at a, a given time. With so no you only guess. care about peak single thread throughput. Yep. And there's a and as long as the correctness is maintained as in you're not getting the wrong results, uh, everything is fine. Have there been any papers or articles on the genuine risk assessment on this? Because, yeah, there are use cases in my lab. So what's a great um, go-to to say stress about this, but not this? There isn't. Okay. At least I don't know of one, and I have looked. The problem is that you really have to think about your workload and understand it far more deeply than you normally would. And you're really playing with fire by leaving those uh, bugs in there. So it should, it's really annoying that uh, the hardware is so broken, but it is what and, it is. And we, and they still charge a, a premium. Mm-hmm. It's, it's broken, but okay. Anything. Anyway, uh, I did find some links. I'll see if any jump out. But uh, yeah, but it's anything else on that topic? When we were still all talking about uh, meltdown because meltdown is basically solved in modern CPUs, and the problem is that the instruction set doesn't specify the timing uh, behaviors and the mm. side channels, and we really have to acknowledge that speculation is in the user's interest at least 95% of the time, probably more like 99 point something, but must be prevented in certain corner cases. So we have to have basically speculation barriers, which are promised by the instruction set to never be exploited by a new microarchitecture for better performance. So that if you put this break here, the CPU will always stall and wait for it. Hmm. to solve this condition. Um, right now we have such things in some cases, but they are not specified. They are just, uh, we observe this behavior out of all hardware we uh, tested and haven't found any hardware which didn't behave like this. That's not really a good state to go forward. But, yeah. Does NUMA more or less make it worse not really um because numa is all at least big numa systems which you won't find many of today uh have the property that you have so much noise that it may actually be almost impossible to exploit some of the timing channels across numa domains are very hard and slow it's always dangerous to see it's impossible because then someone will come around and do a bit of statistics on the noise and find the data in it. <laughs> so yeah, hmm. the problem is that what you can do to mitigate the impact is, for example, if you if you leave hyperthreading enabled, uh, assign both hyperthreads of the CPU to the same guest, so that if you have a cross uh, hyperthread uh, side channel, uh, the guest kernel can only attack itself. Hmm. Which exactly. is kind of pointless, but it doesn't help you if you can use the hyperthreads to attack uh, the host kernel running on one hyperthread and the guest kernel running on the other one of the same core. If there's a side channel in that case, it can still be a problem, but at least you're partitioning your course in such a way and you don't lose the throughput of hyperthreads, which, yeah. Okay. It's so- a question. Anyone seen a blog post on CPU pinning for m- mitigation in virtual environments? <laughs> I have, but I don't have the link. Okay. Uh, so at least that's actionable versus, wow. oh no, all CPUs are broken. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, the other question is, uh, read up on the exact CPUs you have on the microcode update, the change logs, find out what were mitigated, and then check each mitigation, if it still applies to you and if it is actually enabled by default. And for that, at well, least the list of sysctls is uh, a good starting point. Well, let me ask you this, Jan. 
has anyone actually looked at the after effects of the microcode updates and seeing if they were actually working as intended? Um, for them bleed, yes. For but that's a pretty others, recent one. Um, for some spectral, um, for the indirect branch prediction, I think it was at the time called spectral v2. Uh, yes, it worked against the original attack, but you can do an even more complex attack which is slower and requires more preconditions. So sometimes it is only a partial fix. Gotcha. Yeah. And both FreeBSD and the remaining Solaris derivatives suffer from the problem that they're sometimes uh, ignored by the CPU vendors when it comes to uh, developing uh, mitigations so that if we only learn through side channels uh, in the human community. You're uh, saying Illumos on AMD is not the market's top priority? <laughs> it's not just not the market's top priority, but uh, they're excluded from the... Oh, and the disclosure, in the you know. name it, yeah. And even most Linux distributions are, then you suddenly get a patch and you have to understand it and apply it and port it over. I'm throwing in some links that are a bit interesting. A bunch of CPU pinning strips for while for KVM, there might be some insights there, but there is this article mm -hmm. on hardware vulnerabilities in virtualized environments. Yep. I don't know if that's the one you found some time ago, but oh, 2019. So that's when it was breaking news. Okay. Blah, 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 no, blah. it was breaking news almost two years earlier. Broken um, news. Okay. <laughs> but with in Beehive, the dash uh, P, uh, argument on the command line or the equivalent in the configuration file can be used to pin a vCPU thread to a host CPU thread. Mm -hmm. The yeah. problem is that we don't have a helper to basically partition out the available cores. So unless you do it manually by hand, uh, yeah, you can't do that. And normally you don't want to have a text file somewhere with which vCPU has been delegated to which, uh, so which uh, host CPU has been uh, given to which vCPU of which uh, guest. So that you kind of need a core allocator if you really don't want to over commit cores, which uh, is also a good idea because it uh, reduces jitter if you can afford to not over commit on CPU. Okay, anonymous hamster, you have the floor. Really? So the anonymous hamster. Yep, that, that's that's been... actually that's actually me. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the hamster. <laughs> I um I, I was just walking through a stick. couple of Bugzilla tickets. Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> I'm the hamster now. <laughs> unfortunately, a very fortunate name, I guess. I um. I wanted to ask you guys what your experience is on performance uh, of using raw image files on CFS versus using uh, CVALs. Uh, I have to say my personal experience has been what actually is shown on this chart here, uh, that I've, I've had better experience with raw files for, I don't know, for me, inexplicable reasons, really. I, I just, have one I just possibility on that exact point, and Daniel Bell okay. didn't make it today. He thinks there is a weird, perfect storm in which benchmarking the ZVOL will be terrible, but in real-world performance, it's not an issue. So when you look at these numbers, oh. are they synthetic or real-world numbers? So um, go, go one ahead, of the uh, things I've Theme is that if you have a sparse raw file as disk image, uh, as you get guest rights to that file, CFS gets a chance to allocate uh, big blocks for the file because you have well, 
block size there, but uh, up to the maximum block size, but Z volts have a fixed block size. So you kind of have a fixed overhead, but it also means you always have a deterministic block size and performance and right amplification and so on. Uh, I don't know about the numbers you have there. One of the common misconfigurations uh, when benchmarking ZFS as backing storage for virtual machines is to leave the uh, ZFS um, caching unconfigured, which means that you end up with double cached uh, virtual disk where, where both uh, ZFS on the host caches the content and the guest kernel will cache it again which is very wasteful and can, uh, because that means that the arc on the host as, tries to fit as much in, unless you then wire down the guests, you can end up with it, the dreaded uh, arc uh, shrink uh, pauses where suddenly the system throughput drops uh, to ridiculously low numbers uh, while everything is stalled waiting for a ZFS to process new writes and then everything keeps on working again for a while, and then it happens again. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to deal with that right now is to configure uh, the host to only do metadata caching for the guest drives, and then um, have the guests perform uh, their own block device caching, which is what Linux and BSDs do. But I think Windows has a mode where it disables its, its file system cache if it's virtualized, assuming that the hypervisor will cache for it, which Windows does. So that may be the one case where you don't want to do that. If you have a Windows guest, but I don't have enough Windows guests or care about them to debug this and figure out what exactly happens there. And if you can configure Windows to behave like the Unix like system so that you have one host configuration for all. The next case is um, you kind of want to limit the host uh, ZFS arc size to something that prevents it from running against the memory pressure limits of the host kernel. So if you really want consistent low jitter operation, you have to uh, limit both the host arc size and uh, use wired memory for the guests. I think so, uh, OmniOS and the like uh, only support wired guests. And if you want PCI pass through, you also have to go with wired guests. But yeah, that's the long and short of what I have uh, learned about it from it blowing up in my face. Thanks. Uh, Great inputs. I, I didn't actually think about the caching. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. So you kind of want to set it to uh, metadata. The downside is that uh, if you have an L2 arc, which for a hypervisor may actually be interesting because the L2 arc is only a victim cache for the normal L1 arc, uh, you will never put the um, guest blocks into the L2 arc because they are never there to be evicted. So you kind of lose the opportunity to use uh, network there. Yeah, it is what it is. Quick question, Jan. You said make Windows behave more like a Unix system. What in what regard regarding the caching? Like uh, it has been reported among others in earlier of the BF calls that uh, Windows, if it detects that it's virtualized, uh, disables most of the file system caching and assumes that uh, the block device will be cached by the hypervisor. So that means that yeah, for Windows, it may be that you don't end up with double caching, but disabling the host caching will trash Windows performance because it assumes that it will have a cache device, which then, yeah. If and it is now uncached, you really uh, trash performance uh, because you're effectively then running without a reasonably sized uh, file system cache. And that said, do I have it right that your recommendation is to disable the, if it's ZFS and ZFS, disable the uh, VM the primary cache attribute to metadata. Yeah, okay. So default there. is on, 
Yeah. It's possible to set it to off, but you don't want to set it to completely off because you still want to cache metadata like where on disk is this block allocated because it's one on one side it's tiny and on the other side it's really important because you can't issue a read for a block which uh, you don't know the offset of on disk. Okay. Yeah, I think Clara did something on that as yeah. well. So Daniel kindly chimed in and says, yes, they found an issue and he gave some highlighted highlights in what they found. So there. And for larger scale deployments, what may be interesting is to use uh, the in kernel uh, iSCSI client on the host and then use CTL to make it available via Vitio SCSI so that you can have someone else's uh, SAN storage. And if you're running ZFS as a SAN, then because now you have basically two physical machines with their own memory and memory pressure, you want caching enabled because there's nothing to be gained by forcing the um, iSCSI uh, target to always go to disk if there's a chance to cache it. Hmm. Unless you really need that memory for something else. But normally you don't want to suffer the um, media access in addition to the network round trip. So CTL has its own caching? Is that what I'm hearing? No. No, or, or explicitly but if it's not. you use it to uh, expose remote storage to Beehive guests, okay. so that you don't have to run an iSCSI initiator inside your virtual machine, but the host is the iSCSI initiator and makes the resulting block device available to the guest via with iSCSI. Yeah, and I had tried that simply aiming my target at the VM and it somehow just threw errors at me, but I should revisit mm -hmm. that a little deeper. But it's like what two calls back. It was just CTL. It uh I posted it to uh do a search for CTL. So, That's always at risk on these docs, because hey. Uh, maybe ctl.conf or ctld. Let's see, CTL. Because otherwise you get all the CTLs and other. Yeah. I know. That's a little far, far back. Okay, well, anyway, I will try to find that, but I know I posted the error. Um. So Chris, does oh. this mean you are looking at the documentation as a saint and are trying to get the most accurate facts to slip in there? Yes, um, I'm basically considering looking at the uh, at the man pages, and I figured this is a good starting point because there's already a couple points there that uh, Graham raised. Got it. Hostage. Oh, I don't know. Don't worry about me looking for that. But I, yeah, I dropped it in there in somewhere, somewhere in the annals. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jan, how is your scripts for properly sanitizing and isolating CTL ports? I and do other have it things? in uh, exec line for a six RC in a as part of a complicated configuration which does a. IPv6 only uh, with DHCP v6 prefix delegation network configuration. And it's not probably un uh, isolated because it's yeah in a strange scripting language, which like I've assumed like less than 100 people know how to. It, it's not hard to learn. It's easier than shell because it has same quoting words, but it's a weird uh, little thing. So do you have a deadline set for your massive release of all your things that you're working on. Because <laughs> yeah, you have sure. some great Big things bump. coming. <laughs> right now, it's going to be Christmas. Uh... <laughs> yeah, by Christmas. Just don't specify which year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a classic. That's a classic. Or as the sign says, Christmas. OK, uh, Levi, you have a link there. Is that a good one? Tech Republic. Oh, yeah. Let's see. That, yeah, it has some more details on that, but okay. Um, 
I'll chuck it in there for those who celebrate. Okay. Up for debate. <laughs> Chris, you have it flowing. Looking at this bug. Right. So basically, there is a couple of suggestions already in there. I'm wondering if, if you guys have anything, uh, any press in matters that should probably go in there as well. I mean, this is actually focused on the Beehive man page, but if I'm not mistaken, there's a couple other ones also around Beehive. So uh, maybe it might be worthwhile to expand that. And I figure if I really compile that into a patch for the man pages, then I can just as well go all in and, you know, do the whole thing. So one of the absolute classics is if you've got Beehive on a system with ZFS, you burn the memory candle at both ends. You've got the ARP growing and VM memory growing, and then it collides in the middle and bad things happen. And I, you know, officially you should read all implications in the countless ZFS manual pages and the implications in the Beehive manual page and make the connection in your head that, you know, allocating memory in those with like two freight trains coming at each other is a problem. But is that asking the group, is that the kind of thing that should be, kind of given as a small tip hidden in a manual page, or that's just not the way we structure no, it's documentation? Something which should at the very least be part of a handbook or similar documentation, okay. that exact burning a candle on both ends is a good description for it. Um, one of the situations you will commonly encounter that if you start a big beehive guest on a small to medium size uh, desktop or laptop that suddenly uh, everything freezes for a second or five uh, and you you can't scroll and your GUI and so on because what happened is that the VMM instance now is frantically trying to grab uh, more memory than is currently available and evicting everything it can. So basically anything, uh, especially if you're running with a file swap so that any dirty page cannot be un swapped out, but you have to evict anything uh, clean, which means that you will evict lots of code, uh, which is mmapped and, and clean file system caches. So now uh, you evicted all the hot data from the system because the not so hot dirty buffers couldn't be evicted from main memory. Which and yeah, it will shake itself back into a no normal working state quickly, but it, it's annoying. Uh, if you don't know about it, and yeah, for a dedicated hypervisor, you should probably limit how much memory you give the host for its operations, and then yep. you keep a reservation and have Beehive take from that. Uh, you kind of have to decide on the ratio between host and guests, which is not too bad for a dedicated hypervisor machine. But if you have a mixed use machine running both Beehive and Jails, then it becomes uh, complex to tune. Yep. And, and you have to experience with what works for you. And preemptively answering your question, Chris, yes, a year or two ago, we did discuss what mechanism could like try attempt to auto housekeep that and balance requests from like new VM launches versus the ARC. And uh, Andrew, I'd be curious if say OmniOS has some clever mechanism to just keep you from shooting yourself in the foot there, but it's a, it's a like many things, a more challenging problem than on the surface. Oh. I, I don't, don't know about OmniOS, but I think SmartOS from Joint did something where they basically do this, that they have a reservation and then because they expect to run everything virtualized, every real workload, that they keep a big reservation. They don't support over committing memory and that solves a bunch of issues. If you don't support these configurations, but sometimes you want to run them. Okay. And Andrew? Um, I don't know if there's anything clever going on here. I know that, I mean, personally, well, maybe not personally, but here, our solution has been throw money at the problem 
just by gobs of memory. Yeah. <laughs> but as this is definitely you... the kind of thing that needs to be discussed in a handbook because especially somebody just kind of getting started with this, that's not something they're going to readily know about and it's going to cause frustration. Yep. And, you know, for example, on TrueNAS, ZFS is allowed to be most greedy because you've got your like Samba server and then ARC. <laughs> so yeah, throw in a VM and the GUI does throw up a warning, which is good, but uh, as for smarter mechanisms. Uh, and strict there's an, there's an other really nasty corner case on FreeBSD to watch out, especially on bigger system. And that is where ZFS uh, is not NUMA aware. So oh, uh, when, it, when the kernel did in FreeBSD, then the UMA layer uh, in the kernel detects memory pressure in a NUMA domain, it will tell sufficiently smart subsystems that this NUMA domain is under pressure, but ZFS doesn't know that there are multiple NUMA domains, ah. ignores that part, looks at the system and says, but you have 40 gigs of free memory. Why should I shrink my arc? And just ignores that. So, and to, uh, because it says there is, yeah, I, just a spurious notification. Uh, I don't have no reason to shrink the arc because there is no memory pressure. If you look at the full system, uh, it can become deadly if you have unbalanced NUMA uh, domains. So let's say you have one DIM which isn't uh, properly seated uh, or, or one memory channel uh, on an older Ryzen uh, or Epic, which were quite infamous for that, that this, sometimes you don't have the perfect mounting pressure and one of your DIM channels is unreliable and only works some of the time. Every boot is a lottery if you get all, all eight memory channels. So, and then you have a NUMA domain at worst, which is half the size of the others. Uh, and the result is that it will always be under normal load and, and deadly memory pressure. And this can really life lock your system because it can end up in such a bad state and high memory pressure in the NUMA domain that uh, FreeBSD will not just page out pages, but truly swap out complete processes and will refuse to swap them back in at all before memory pressure is reduced, which will never happen in this case. So for example, if you debug that and you run top, uh, top runs because it's busy enough to uh, not, and doesn't use a lot of memory, so it will not get uh, swapped out. But once you, uh, enter exit top uh, in a state of confusion, uh, the kernel will refuse to page back in your shell because it has been completely swapped by then. Really? And it says, no, 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 I'm not starting to swap back in completely swapped out processes until memory pressure is better because uh, that will just lead to more thrashing. Hmm. And uh, yeah, the only way to deal with that if you have a system where one DIM isn't detected, uh, either because it's not properly seated or because it's damaged, uh, it's ECC checks during startup, whatever, you uh, just uh, have to disable kernel NUMA awareness completely, which at least, especially on first generation Epic uh, CPUs was really painful. Oh. Because those were basically a quad socket system on a single socket. And yeah. So that's not fun. Uh, I don't know if anyone is looking at making ZFS really NUMA aware uh, so that it would evict from the NUMA domain where the memory pressure is and not the other ones. And yeah. That sounds like a good thing to bring up at the meeting that happened yesterday. Which one? The ZFS called The ZFS yesterday. meeting. Yeah, it has been brought up. At the, I think once, but uh, during a smaller meeting where none of the relevant folks were there. And the problem is the more uh, relatively small NUMA domains you have, because as you get in more NUMA domains, they, as a percentage of the whole capacity, become smaller. The, the smaller the load this, uh, change between NUMA domains has to be to uh, trigger this kind of behavior. 
which means that at some point, if you have enough Numa domains, you may actually encounter this with a balanced system in under normal workloads. So Chris, to also answer your question, I suspect the examples section could always benefit from some love. Uh, for example, it mentions beehive load, which is still supported. I suspect it doesn't make any mention of the grub to beehive for what it's worth. And then things like NVMe support for Windows guests might be worthy of some attention because that's sort of a common desirable approach. Um, and I guess there's not, they're not using uh, the config format. So an example of simply pointing at the configuration format or dumping it would be good. And now here's a scary part. You may not know to even go look for beehive config, which is that even misrendered? I thought that should be one thing, but, oh. Yeah, that might that be a web fun. thing, I think. That yeah, that, like that, but that's, I think, on the web, I believe. Uh, yeah. yeah, the heuristics for the web do not. Yeah. Because yeah. the that's link is generated using yeah. heuristics. There isn't a link in the uh, MDoc format. Ah, so but, if you want to get the depth of John Baldwin's like wisdom and insight, this manual page, which is invaluable if you want to try that feature, keeps going. <laughs> Bless his heart. And, and so, going. And going. going. <laughs> And uh, Andrew has the config file support made it to Illumos. Um, I, I'm I'm not aware maybe, of maybe this. Not. And don't get me wrong, heaven forbid this have say an example or two at the bottom because. Well, the one thing I constantly look up is how to get the dump of your config. So it actually, you take a beehive string. I, throw in a dash o something or other and get a, a dump and then modify it to need because it's sometimes tricky to get that right. Uh, note the uh, config manual. Uh, okay, so yeah, to, to, again, to answer your question, uh, there's some things that have jumped out for a while now. Got it. And hey, yeah, uh, nobody wants those to be under documented. It's been a question of limited time resources and um, you name it. So I hope the world is fine with that and appreciates what we've collectively gotten so Maybe, far. Uh, yes, instead Jan. of making the main page even longer, uh, it would be good to just drop a, f a reference to a few examples, which should probably go into user share examples beehive. Hmm. They put a few example configuration files with comments in there and use the same examples for documentation in other places. Rue and while manual pages are fundamentally like in context, they're also remarkably valuable on the web as we're doing right now. So maybe complementing those. And there is an examples directory, but it's simply vmrun.sh, which itself can use some uh, love. It's not very Windows friendly. It's not very friendly with other OSs, some of which are easy fixes. Go ahead, Jan. And it's only a one-shot tool to use on the command line, really. It's not good enough for right. so, my opinion for real production deployment, for example. Use it. But yeah, it, you have yeah. lots of, similar to jail managers, you have several you have managers uh, hmm. around and potentially you can use the J command to run the app. But yeah. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Jan. You actually, I, you answered my question without me asking it. Uh, you Which one? It. Uh, how to disable NUMA should you really want to yep. go that way? Thank you. If you have to, so, I found that at least in 12 and 13, zero, uh, you had to do that with an unbalanced system. Hmm. Okay. Luckily, I got someone to lend me remote hands and replace the damaged dim. You have balance in your life. Hmm? You have balance in your life. Hmm. 
ignore that one. Anyway, other topics, questions, documentation issues. Um, Chris, I hope the point was well taken that countless perceived issues are documentation issues. Just it's true of and any open source technology example, because those who produce it are like producing it and might even be the least qualified people to document it. And uh, we just have to deal with it. Go ahead. One of the problems is, for example, pinning uh, vCPUs and limiting memory and so on has always been possible, or at least for ages. Uh, and with CPU state, you could probably have done it even before BF itself could do it. The downside is that what is missing again is something to uh, not pin a single VM, but start a VM with close together CPUs, which are unpinned busy, find close, a, a large-ish topology wise, close together set of logical CPUs on the host to pin the vCPU threads to. This command does not exist. It should probably be a, some kind of command which could you could use in a chain loading uh, startup script to basically append uh, to the Beehive uh, configuration, the pinning, so that you can do it with dollar add or something if you are doing it in shell or with some other external helper. What's the um, exact grouping? Is it, you know, on the host you have either... The host, uh, so FreeBSD at least, I can't speak for the Solaris mm -hmm. operating system. Uh, the uh, Kernel will um, do a good job at discovering the topology of the CPUs. So basically go by sockets, um, then clusters inside a socket, maybe even interconnects across sockets, but mostly it starts at a socket. Then inside the socket, you have maybe different dies, then, which are normally where your L3 cache domains are, for example, on a very big Xeon. Yeah. You may want to logically split that into two NUMA domains to limit the uh, ring bus latency, then on the next level up, you have the shared level two caches, and then you have the level one caches and the hyper threads sharing those. And then you have the odd one out like uh, CMT on AMD uh, bulldozer and pile driver derived designs, where you had these strange setup where you had basically independent front end and a shared CPU back end. Hmm. Which Where does that one see that? D message or caches, but she had data oh, cache. Sorry. Is there a user space tool to see some of that or just D message and uh, so it's, uh, you know, I think you can the kernel can emit that. Ah, uh, any examples? That sounds quite yeah. Oh, and this is where John D got gnarly because with networking, sometimes you want to pin. As you push limits, you want to, ooh, I would love to, okay. So, so for one. example, on this mm -hmm. is how it looks uh, if it fits into a message. Let's check, no, it's too, even a six combo machine with hyper threading is too long. Um, so it basically tells me that I have at the top level, no, there is no cache at this level, and I have 12 logical CPUs. Is it always and JSON formatted, the, or is there an alternative? It's not one? JSON, it's XML oh, on my That's XML. Oh, sorry. Yeah, XML. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the kernel doesn't parse it, but it, it's easy to emit a known structure because it's so limited. It's not like okay. there's arbitrary things yeah. in there. It's just a bunch of printers basically emitting that. And because you only put numeric values in there, it's not hard to generate valid XML. Yeah, totally. That's cool. I just launched on a machine and out that popped. Yeah, that's a tiny little machine, but yes. Yes, it's tiny. Cool. So, oh no, that's not the complete message. Okay. Oh no, yeah, it's, it keeps going. Uh, that's just a little exactly. Ryzen B link. Yeah, oh, and you've got uh, the caches. Maybe I should throw the whole thing in there. I mean, let's go wild. I mean, it's a multi-hundred page doc already. Who will notice? Um, I should break that um, up quarterly. I'm terrible. I'm busy. Whatever. 
just the beginning of a new quarter, take the existing document, put it in another oh, one. I know. And That's the least, yeah. The, the, just lock rotate the file. The mechanics of it are easy. The getting it done are, yeah. Yeah. Actually, guys, I, I was always wondering, um, is this actually indexed by Google? I mean, there's so much knowledge in there. I, I'm wondering, I mean, is anyone finding Yeah, that? it's a public document, I think. Uh, uh, Google I've Docs. It is, okay. I'm, I'm not convinced Google will ever find Google Docs. So mm, maybe. Uh, I think if there's an That's app to it, it may find it. But yes. Um, and the problem is, of course, that these are just notes. This isn't reviewed, not... This is just programs and ideas, so which on that... is valuable as a starting point, but it's kind of dangerous for those who like to copy and paste the questions. Mm. <laughs> okay, good point. Yeah. <laughs> very Sorry. Good point. Yeah, so when that retirement That's sabbatical flashback. comes, one of us can go through this, but... <laughs> make, make a book out of it. There you go. Yeah, just what uh, Michael Lucas read. And a dramatic reading to go with it. Because uh, Beehive may actually sell more copies than some of the other specialty file system stuff. He is not ruling that out, but he's in a similar situation to, say, Chris and friends. Like, okay, just tell us what to run. Just, 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 just show me. Just, just show me the canonical. No questions. No mystery. Totally up to date. Yeah, that's kind of a problem that. You need a lab environment to test this on, put it under load because yeah. a lot of things work uh, and boot fine and then don't produce the performance you want under load. Yep. But or the different kind of working topologies research. and goodies. And well, yeah, that and... would be the important part. Like, <laughs> which of the available technologies have the performance to go with? Uh, production uh, hypervisor deployment. And people are using it every single hour of every day. So, well, but the, the question is answered by definition, but still. Anyway, other topics on this fine Thursday morning, evening. Uh, Chris, one, thank you. Two, I suppose... I hope that's helpful and maybe reviews yes. are the way to do it. Uh, things like examples, 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 and catching the previous examples up. So there uh, you will find examples in FreeBSD with like AT hard drive devices, and they haven't had those for like a decade or two. And so like, just got to stay vigilant. <laughs> And Anjanik has been advocating for a versioned handbook such that, well, this all applies to 13, this applies to 14, but that may introduce its own issues. So I don't know what the right answer is. And if we all had the right answer, it would probably be solved by now, but it's a big that challenge. It used to be like that. Wasn't it like that? I, I, I could I swear there used I to be I think you version. got a snapshot of the release handbook state with releases. It was on the install media and so on and you could find it on the website but the default wasn't versioned and has always fallen behind and basically been written in such a way that it works with the oldest still uh, relevant release so no why change it uh, if it don't, the new improved version isn't com that much better and only a version available on the latest major release so if we now have to document the old way for the other two major releases. So yeah, that's kind of always the trade-off there, which means that we get out of date documentation, which works, but it's not the best way to do it anymore. Even and then the people get know, into retro computing and suddenly want all that old docs. It's like, really, guys? <laughs> yeah, huh. th th that's not a problem. Give them the old snapshot yeah. of it. Yep. Tell them this is the state as of this release and it's bundled with a release. What's the problem? Uh, if someone wants to run a FreeBSD on a 486, let them. And in Chasing Regressions, I found that the DVDs are pretty darn important because if you want to rebuild Samba from like five years ago, good luck because anything that the ports pull it from is long gone 
any art build artifacts are long gone, but the DVDs do have a reasonably good spread of binaries. So, um, something to, uh, yeah, but only for the uh, oldish versions. Correct. The DVDs no longer have many packages or something like that on them. Oh, do they? Oh, then that's a new upcoming so. problem. Hmm. They just include the tarballs of the uh, operating system and uh, not very much more, I think. The DVD? Okay, it's a, it's a question. Let's see. It may include a few packages, but not the sources to build the packages. If you Precisely. Know yeah, it's the stuff. packages which, I mean, good yeah. luck finding the sources regardless, unless there's some repo you can yeah, walk but, your way back in. That's but, something yeah. which would be useful to basically have... As part of our official port infrastructure, uh, at least a slowish cache. It doesn't have to be fast, but really make sure that you do dist fetch uh, for all possible configuration of each port, uh, so that if you have optional patches which aren't pulled in unless some flags are set and so on, that you patch uh, pull those in. Um, <laughs> the problem is that we are talking about. Hundreds of terabytes of a time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It only has to be like two, two or three copies of that. And, but yeah, it will grow and it's not something you or I want to keep around. And if, even if someone. I tried enough... keeping some of that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Anyway, other topics or are we good to go? I can stick around a few minutes. And how about I say. Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, talk perhaps tomorrow for the OCI, just introductory call. I'm not here to step on any of uh, you know the enterprise working group's toes. It was simply DCH reaching out to the developer and the developer saying, hey, I can't make it on Wednesdays at that time. I'm doing I Aikido. <laughs> anyway, thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>